Well, it's going to be a very, very hard talk because the thoughts are hard and uh, they're not final. It's not something that I'm certain about by any means. Last week we start, we left off by talking about an ends against the middle dualism. We said that it was an object-oriented reactive dualism where one being created objects and the other being reacted and destroyed those objects. When we're thinking about uh, dualism, it doesn't require an object for there to be reaction or antagonism or interaction. Just the uh, nature of character being antithetical or antagonistic can be enough to result in that kind of a struggle. It doesn't have to be over an object. We uh, see this a lot in art, where we see one color actively struggling with another color, in our consciousness anyway, even though there is no object that the colors are struggling over. In fact, it is uh, silly to think of things that way. Or we see positive and negative particles interacting quite strongly until there is some kind of uh, neutralization or equilibrium or something like that. And probably one of the best examples is cyclones and anticyclones struggling with each other. And in the interaction between them, it produces weather. And uh, all of the benefits of life that come out of changes of weather. The benefits are important because if there is struggle and antagonism or very active interaction, it doesn't have to be seen as a negative activity just in its existence because out of the experience something very positive is born. It even doesn't require that uh, both beings attack each other, or that they uh, intentionally struggle with each other. As we saw it from the uh, Avesta last time, Ahura Mazda never at any time uh, actively uh, fought with Angra Menu. That what happened was that uh, one created, one destroyed, and the other one just kept right on creating. And there wasn't necessarily a struggle over things. However, usually, as we understand it in manifest reality, the dualistic forces that do exist usually do struggle. And there is, uh, it is quite an active, uh, quite an active kind of struggle. So, to repeat all of this, that if there is a both ends against the middle, a horizontal dualism, active or reactive, it doesn't necessarily have to mean that there is a, a bilateral struggle. It doesn't necessarily mean that there has to be an object that things are struggled over. Now, we're going to move on to another facet of dualism, or I had hoped to move on to another facet of dualism, but this one was way too immature. It was way too immature to leave this facet of dualism, and I found out that before I could move on, I really had to go into more of this, uh, more of this before we could really go on. To look a little further at the ends against the means dualism in Zoroastrianism, we're going to have to explore Zoroastrian literature. And I've made a little uh, table of uh, the history of Persia and the history of uh, Zoroastrianism. Before there were Persians, there were 
Turkomanians. And there were the original Persians. And after the original Persians, there was a mix with the and uh, Medes. And uh, eventually they all became Persians. Now, before any of this took place, there was another religion in that part of the country. That is the religion of the Magi. And the original Pers Persians came... That is straight out of, uh, straight out of Zarathustra. And it was a reaction to the uh, religion of Magism because the Magi were basically uh, like Indian religion. And Zara, that's the thing that our Zarathustra was struggling against. There were influences from the... Uh, oh, this is... Uh, at this time... Chorasmanian is the dynasty that is here. This is Achmanian, and this is uh, followed by the Parthian, and then later on the Sassonian. These are the dynasties, and these are the peoples associated with them. When, uh, at the time of the Parthian Persians, after Zarathustra died, then it was again a period of the Magi were active. Then, uh, in the Parthian and Sassonian, the uh, Zoroastrianism came back. And it came back in two forms. Oops. Mazdism. And off to the side, Zervanism. And uh, Zervanism was a mixture between Magism and Mazdaism. Mazdaism. Ah, I did leave something out of there. And then, out of this came two stems, both very extreme. One's Manichaeism, Mazdakism. And then, running cutaneous with them, the uh, Magism came, ba came back and it came into Europe very strongly in the form of Mithraism, which was almost a complete reversion back to uh, uh, Magism. When Zoroastrianism became Mazdaism, it became very powerful. 
It became a legal, political, and it had the uh, power of life and death over people. And it could issue death sentences, and it became very, very extreme in its uh, in its dualism. Zerbinism was a uh, reaction to the extremity. It was considered heretical. It was mostly dualistic. But at the same time, it had elements of monotheism and it had elements of polytheism. I know almost nothing about Mazdakism, uh, but Manichaeism is uh, very influential in modern mystery schools, modern Western mystery schools. Uh, Manichaeism interacted with Gnosticism and it interacted with Neoplatonism and it interacted with uh, primitive Christianity, and it was very active until the uh, 7th century A.D. Uh, some people claim it still is, on an esoteric level, a very active kind of uh, religion. So we're going to be drawing now from Mazdaism, which is what the, we could call this orthodox. I wouldn't say that Mazdaism is heterodox. It's sort of like uh, goes beyond fundamentalism. Okay, we're going to take a few quotes from uh, uh, Mazdaism because I don't have uh, uh, the texts. The texts are very hard to find in English and they're huge. They're very, you know, they read volumes and volumes of it. By the time of Mazdaism, Ahura Mazda has become Orzmad. Is now what Ahura Mazda is called. Ah, <laughs> I get it. Uh, Ormaz. That's about the fourth time I've done that. And uh, Angra Menu has become... Now, if I get this spelling wrong again, too, and... Yeah. Has become Araman. And what we want to look at are some of the statements about the nature of Ormazd and uh, Araman. They're very, some of them are very difficult statements. Um, Ormazd and Araman lie across the void from each other. They have an existence on either side of the void. However, the void is not like the void of the old Testament, and neither is it like the void of Buddhism. Uh, much later, when we go more thoroughly into Mazdaism and all the stories that are in it, it's quite a quite a pronounced story. We'll talk about the void. Ormazd is good and is light and is unlimited in time. That is, Ormazd is eternal. The Ormazd is limited in, limited in space by the void and by Araman. That is to say then that what we would call spirit, which is all light, all life, and all being, is unlimited in time. But it is limited by and in the void, and it is limited in space by Araman. Araman is dark and evil. He's limited in space by the void and by Ormaz, who lies beyond the void. And he is limited in time. Limited in time by the certainty that he will be eventually ruined by Ormaz, who initiates no struggle but when uh, Araman starts it, uh, Ormazd finishes it. 
So it's a very interesting conception in terms of time and space. And we're going to spend most of the rest of the evening addressing this, but it isn't going to sound exactly like this. Ormazd and Araman lie across the void from each other. Ormazd is light and good and full of being. Ormazd is unlimited in time, though he is limited in space by the void and by Araman. He still does not become unlimited in space, even when he overcomes Araman, but that's, that's another issue. Araman is dark and evil, and he's limited in space by the void and by Or Ormazd, who goes beyond the void, and and Araman is limited in time by the certainty of his eternal rune by Ormazd, who initiates no struggle, but who prevails when Araman does starts started. Okay, this is something enormous, and it's very profound and hard and deep, and I've been struggling with it for weeks now, and uh, this may not come out very well tonight. But let's look a little bit more at the extreme character, or the extreme statement of character of Araman which is really very, very hard to deal with. These are the statements about the nature of Araman. He is not, he once was not, and again will not be. That is, he was and is not, and yet will not be. Very strange notion. In fact, I have uh, busted my head over this paradox for a long time. It sounds almost like uh, uh, double talk. It may even be too difficult for me to be clear about or to be, have any good thoughts about at all. First, let's, let's take and contrast it to something that we know from Orthodox Christianity. It's, I believe it's even part of Christian hymns. As it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be. Who was, and is, and ever shall be. These are descriptions of divine being, which are just the opposite of is not, once was not, and again will not be. This kind of dualism, placing the statements of uh, Christianity in on the nature of Ormaz, is very much in agreement. So if we took those statements and counterposed them to Araman, uh, it would be uh, undeniable. The ancient Persians would have loved it. In fact, some of, some of the... Uh, the Sassonians, Sassonian uh, Persians, uh, were active in post-Christian times, at least 200 years after the birth of Christ. Zoroastrianism was still developing. There's an awful lot of paradox here, and an awful lot of very difficult paradox. When you talk about what was not, what is not, and has never been, or never will be, the it has uh, a negative existence, or a negative non-existence, so that one can't even address it. It's so negative that there is no statement that one can be positive about it. So this is... Uh, very interesting if we're trying to understand the nature of evil, and the nature of evil is in a being whose non-existence is so shadowy that it's hard to put a positive statement to it. This is the paradox in this is, 
if we try to speak of perfect being or a perfect being, we find ourselves also running up against ineffability, but an ineffability of another kind, because when we talk about that which is perfect, or that which is that profound in its spiritual being, we have no words but words that come from limitation. So it turns out that if we want to speak about the divine good, we have to speak about it in terms of limitation. Uh, it, it's almost like saying that we need, uh, we need non-being. And we've come back to the idea that we had last time that God needs an adversary to keep God honest. Uh, because that's the way that the conception works. To conceive even in the uh, most abstract sense, either being or non-being, is defined or understood coincidentally with, it, with its antithesis. That is to say, we can't talk about the negative, we can't talk about non-being, and we can't talk about evil without talking about good. That it, in the same way that we can't talk about the good without at least bringing in limitation, there's no way that we can, that we can talk about good. This means then that there is no conscious knowledge of anything except in the mind. And because of the limited and limiting nature of the mind, there is no certainty about being or non-being, and all that we have is a polar dualism. So this is, it's like saying that all of our knowing of things through conscious knowing, by the ability to think, or by the ability to apperceive reality or non-reality, and to make a statement, we automatically have to use dualism. It is the nature of the mind. This is paradoxical, because it means the things about one, about which one would want to be most certain, like divine being, so one would certainly want to be certain when speaking about that or thinking about it, it means that we only have uncertain limitation in duality. On the other hand, when we do things with the mind, with all of the limitations of the mind, and we seem to arrive at certainty, we only also arrive at non-certainty there. If we look at science, the scientific method, all of the things that science says, it can't really, it very rarely makes any statements saying this is the way things are. It says this is only a tentative hypothesis, or this is a speculation, and almost uh, all scientific experiments can say that this isn't the way things are. All of our knowledge from science is that, that there is a limiting of trying to describe reality by saying, hey, we know it isn't this, because if it were, this would be provable. All of our measurements are uncertain. All of our measurements are limited. And so even our most positive things that we have in modern the modern world, in the world of intellect, the world of science, are also unlimited. It's like, in a way, no matter what, in our being, we have uncertainty. Oh, 
it's just hard to go into some of these things. Existence, even in its most fundamental existential sense, not talking about a perfect being, but just what we experience day by day, is known by the insecurity of not knowing, which we just said. While the paradox is that non-being is kenned or not known with a kind of security in a limited sense that is unlimited. That's extremely paradoxical. I'll try to describe it. The aramonic non-being that is not, was not, and never will be, is something like an intaglio. It has only a being through non-being. You know what an intaglio is? An intaglio is a ring that things are scooped out and something like, it's like a form that you pour something into. And you, it's the opposite of a cameo. What we're trying to get at is the image of intaglio and cameo. But intaglio is the only, is a way, if you think of an intaglio, think of a face of somebody with a helmet that's uh, made by scooping out something like, uh, oh, I don't know, ruby or something like that. What's the, what's the black stone that's usually used? Onyx. Taking onyx is where, where intaglios are usually made. I like the whole idea of the blackness because then there's darkness. And scooping some of it out, and you have, in essence, a figure that is the, it is an existence of non-existence. On the other hand, if you have a cameo, a cameo is made by non-existence taking away more and more things until there is something there. But the non-existence never leaves because a cameo or this uh, music stand or the chair or our body is something that exists but not in the same way that everything that is not it exists. The negative space has a greater reality in its negativity or non-being than manifest being. So we have all kinds of very, very subtle and very difficult interactions of being and non-being. I'm going to read almost directly from my notes here because the next statement is a very long statement and it's very hard to get out. When we try to understand non-being through the concept of negative space, that is by seeing an object, realizing that everything that isn't that object is negative space, and both are defined by the object, a limited existential object, it isn't really clear what is being or what is not being. Especially when it dawns on us that if negative space is non-being, it's going to continue even when the object is gone. Do you see what I mean? If the object is or is in a state of being, when the object is gone, the negative space that it defined will still be there. And it's almost uh, difficult then to understand what is positive and what is negative. From the viewpoint of mystical thought, the non-being of negative space that projects an image 
or within which an image is defined either by elimination or by addition seems more positive and that is what really positive space is. And that what we consider positive existence to be, the things that are around us, may very well be illusions. So we are at a paradox that in some way the uh, eternal non-being of Araman seems almost more real than the existence of Orzmad or that we have it all backwards about what is and what isn't. Maybe both are good. Maybe both are real and maybe both are evil. Or maybe both are non-existent. All of these kinds of conceptions, if we seek an absolute answer, if we seek a final and certain answer, we cannot get to from dualism. Dualism automatically means uncertainty. But uncertainty, like disequilibrium, then leads to progress. Because if we're uncertain and we seek for the certainty, we learn new things and things progress. However, if we're certain there would be no there would be no end. Or there would be an end, it would be right there. So we have paradox. When we have uncertainty, we have paradox. If we try to be more realistic and think about the statement about the non-existence of Araman or the character of Araman being that of non-existence, maybe they're more relative. And maybe our think, even though they're stated in very absolutist terms, as is not, was not, and will not be, maybe those are just absolute statements that are necessitated for philosophical reasons to make a complete statement. So maybe it's something uh, we should look uh, on a more relative level, the level that we exist on. However, when we bring things down even to relative existence, more paradoxes occur. Sounds like an excellent episode. <laughs> About the episode of a man who is locked in a cell and every time you create anxiety on his, his dark force arises and snatches them out of their own reality and sinks them into nothing space. Remember that episode? Oh, I don't know anything about the X-Files. Never, never have seen a... I don't have anything to play it on. Uh, yes. Is it so hard to accept then uh, something that was not in the beginning is not now or will never be? Is it so hard to accept that uh, if there is only one force yeah, we're going to come to that. Okay. Yeah, this, that's we're going to be playing along those ideas all all along. What we're looking at right now is that in the absolute sense, we can't we can if we make a positive statement about being, it's limited, and if we make a positive statement about non-being, it's limited, and there is as much insecurity in saying that. Uh, there is something that never was, because when you make that statement, you're making a positive statement, and that's already taking away from the non-being of the existence. Whereas if we say if there is something that always was, our statement in itself is coming from reality, and that limits the, uh, the uh, eternality of the thing that we're pointing to. Uh, <laughs> yeah. You, that's that's what we're trying to do. So we're, we're, 
this, this, uh, I'm going to try and get the more practical things through this because this is a uh, very difficult, uh, you know, if evil is non-being and good is being, uh, then we have to say, well, we'll, we'll, we'll get to it. We'll come down. If we don't look at absolute non-being, we get into considerations then of change and of actions which are in relative matters. For example, in later Mazdaism, uh, there is a, an active struggle, and for a, non, a non-being initiates a struggle against Ormazd, which Ormazd prevails in. This is kind of unusual to think of something that never was uh, starting a fight. <laughs> uh, it's, it's a very, very difficult sense. So you, you realize that it, there has to be something that we're talking about, uh, something relative. But we're again faced with uh, a paradox if we talk about the relative and relative action and relative inaction when we think uh we when we where we might get to the point where uh good is evil and evil is good. So we have to realize that we cannot make definitive statements all the way about either good or evil from a dualistic point of view. But if we want to look at what is good, since we are living under the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, we have to do that very thing. But in so doing, we're never going to come to something complete and absolute. All right. Now, the view, as we saw last time when we looked at the, uh, when we looked at the Zendavesta, we saw that this view came from a conceptualization that was formed in observation. Right now we can see that very uh, clearly. And so maybe we, we're looking at a misconception. Winter is approaching, and there seems to be an active <coughs> destructive force in freezing and frost that destroys living plant forms. If we look and we see when the frost hits the leaves, uh, it just kills the plant. So this looks like an active destructive force. However, if we look at this phenomenon in another way, with a different perspective, what we are observing is the retraction of the warm, life-filled energy of the sun, which forces a retraction of energy in living plants. And that there really is, if looked at from another perspective, there is not a destructive force in frost. And to say that frost killed things is to say, is like saying that the sun rises. We know that the sun doesn't rise, but that the earth turns into it. And we know that when the greater force of life or the greater source of life withdraws relatively, this causes things to cool down, which forces a withdrawal on the lesser sorts of things. So there really isn't a destructive force. If we abstract this back to the absolute case, this would be that there would be no active evil principle. Despite what uh, the Orthodox Zoroastrian said, or what the Mazdans, Mazdists said later, all it is, is a withdrawal of the good principle. Now this, if we look in life, this has a lot going for it. Because the people who appear to be the most nasty and evil seem to be people 
who are the most deprived of love and of goodness and of all of the things that heal and nurture and foster and grow the soul. So this sounds like a pretty interesting way of looking at things. Like maybe there is one force, and it's when that one force isn't applied, then uh, then it appears as if there is a destructive force. But then we start thinking about things. What are then poisons or diseases? They clearly do not look like uh, the loss of love and goodness. They look like active forces. Clearly, a poison is a much different thing than frost. It's, it's an agency that sets out to kill, even in innocent nature. So, again, if we abstract to the absolute, to the resistless resistance of non-being, is that resistless resistance, is that merely just a negative space, or is it evil? And isn't it uh, giving definition to goodness? So it seems to me that these things are a matter of how and where we place our observation and value. If we place value in existential reality and the sustenance of the existential reality, then non-being or what promotes non-being seems inimical or evil. However, if one transcends duality, then it becomes a matter of indifference. But if we do that, then the intuitive meaning of existence is lost, or at least misunderstood. What appears to be most healthy is to give everything we have to existential reality while simultaneously having our vantage in the higher all-being. We'll come back to that again. I'm just trying to introduce some different ideas here as, so that it isn't too painfully dualistic. If we do this, if we have two foci of life, where we live and move and have our being in love, in light, in life, and that we put everything that we have into manifest existence, with no malice, just trying to live out that which can't be spoken of. It may be known intuitively, but it can't be known uh, intellectually. If we do that, uh, we're doing the best that we can. But that still leaves the nagging problem of what is the nature of evil. If we have this parallel approach, we have bliss and a positive neutrality and all of the uh, goodness, the non-action of non-being would bring us a definite knowledge of action, change, and being when we are seeing through the other focus. Meaning to say, if we have an eye on the eternal at the same time that we are living in the relative, we would know that we are moving because the eternal doesn't move. That we know that we progress in consciousness, we know that we progress in motion, change, and action by things that are not moving or relatively 
not moving. It's then saying, this is really hard to bring these ideas all through. I'm trying to bring too much through, I think, all at one time. But you'll see. We'll, we'll get somewhere. If the non-change or non-being in its absolute or eternal quality has a benign or neutral negativity, oh, I don't know how to say this. Let me stop and think for a few minutes. Is the non-activity or the resistless resistance of non-being, is that the same thing as active actions of evil, such as murder or trying to block someone's, someone's consciousness so that they can't know or feel or experience reality? So we are right back at the same questions, no matter which way we turn. I've been agonizing for weeks on this, and I think people have been agonizing for centuries, trying to understand the nature of evil, and every time we take a new turn, uh, it... Uh Clearly, we're, we're far enough along that we know that if Araman is not, never was, or never will be, he certainly couldn't initiate negative activity. Uh, we know that. And that the negative activity is, appears to be some kind of reaction to the assertions of something positive or the uh, re- retraction of something positive, though well, each of those has paradoxes of its own. We've gotten that far. If it is true that absolute action and absolute inaction are present and not present in the potential, we can understand or we can conceive that these things are there. However, the non-being in the character of a non-malignant being, that it could initiate activity, even destructive activity, doesn't seem likely. When we go down the street, the buildings seem to come toward us. And um, when we step out of a boat, the boat does push away. So it does look that, does look like that all actions to some extent have to do with being. But this brings us again right back to the whole question of projection. Projection and reactive motion from projections. Just as the mind has dualism endemic in it, dualism has projection endemic in it. That we cannot do anything in the mind without projection. This is why the mind has always been considered the lens of creative activity, that all creation of the divine comes in taking thought. And in taking thought, there is a projection. The mind is the thing that projects all things into manifest existence. This in itself is disturbing because... um, We can't, if we want to know absolute being, it means that we have to renounce the mind. (laughs) And it is through the mind that we come to most of our, uh, that we come to most of our knowledge. And if we look at people, 
even people who come from a feeling path that are highly enlightened beings interacting with them, we see that they have supremely strong minds. So therefore the renunciation of the mind and the uncertainty and the dualism that is in it does not seem to be necessary in order to come to enlightenment. However, there is again the two-track or the parallel approach whereby if we have our consciousness in unified being, then we transcend the uncertainties of the mind, but we do not necessarily have to not act in them. And we can have simultaneously two kinds of consciousness running in a parallel track. Even though it doesn't look like it, we have now come back to the problem of what is evil or what is good. In any case, right now we have projection as the boogeyman. Does this mean that there are good projections or there are bad projections and that uh, the kind of projection is what makes good or evil? Dualism is terribly frustrating in this regard. When we looked at the Branch Davidians last time, we said that uh, individually and collectively they did project darkness and insecurity in, onto the world, saying that there was an evil that was out to destroy them. And they were attacked. That's a fact. And they were put in the unenviable position of defending or resisting their own projective, even though they were, they were defending against other people who had walked into their projection. Again, projection is also a matter of perspective. It is a matter of intent, and it is a matter of identification. Projection is a matter of perspective, intent, and identification. There is a very great difference between creative imagination, whereby the divine lives out for keeps its imaginings, and there is a reaping of positive experience. That's a very big difference from a projection by an insecure, petty person who projects a delusion or an indulgent fantasy projected for some kind of personal compensation. There's a big difference between the two of them. So now we are seeing that there are good projections and bad projections. There is something common to both of them. Experience results in either case, more experience and positive experience in the case of divine creation. Divine creation is so perfect that it can take from unity and it can project and it can project something that does have active antagonisms like poisonous cobras and rattlesnakes and gentle little bunnies. And it isn't personal. See, the perspective is altogether different. In the divine creation, even though there is killing, it isn't a malicious killing. There is a positive experience whereby both grow and both evolve in the constant struggle of being becoming better a prey and better predators in cases where there is not symbiosis, and it isn't all competition, and it isn't all struggle. Therefore, we can see then if the intent is out of harmony with the higher divine intent, then the progression, the, the projection is likely to be uh, something that is disruptive, 
and it's going to lead to all kinds of inefficient, destructive soil and inefficient growth at the very best. So if dualism, if we are looking at good and evil and that they are indeed projections, it looks like that from the perspective of the divine unity, it is altogether different than if it is from the perspective of humans and human insecurity, human weakness, and human malice. So we are again at a place that even from dualism, that there is some convergence with what we saw last year when we looked at the Garden of Eden story, when we said that evil was local to humans. Because if we look at all the rest of nature, all the rest of nature does not have the malicious destructiveness and the wanton, wasteful destructiveness that come from human things. We are the ones that uh, uh, disrupt and goof up nature by putting in all sorts of chemicals that, uh, uh, you know, that were never intended in evolution and produce cancers even in innocent beings like catfish at the bottom of the, at the, bottom of the lake or something like that. So it's pretty safe to say then that probably the greatest source of pathological and destructive projection is a shift of emphasis from the transcendent, the ever-present, interpenetrating one, to not only to the many, but to the diversity, to the vantage point, of the individual ego. This is a really big fall. This is a huge fall. If our consciousness gets into a lower conscious center instead of a higher consciousness, the perspective is much different. And it's incapable of working for the good of all even to its own ends. And if one is closed off from that transcendent unity and can't see things clearly, one is also closed off from what might one might call the spiritual sunlight. If that's the case, uh, it's possible to get things so backwards that one identifies with oneself as being counter to the one purpose. And this is basically what evil is. However, if we look at it this way, we're saying then that we're back to saying that the most malignant evil just is a sick soul and not a really basically evil being. This is even true in collective activity. If there are groups of evil people, gangs of thugs, or even if those beings are more advanced than humans, if there are demonic beings from higher life waves than ours, the same principle would be true. Now there are some very practical things about all of this. Very simple. First, there are obvious practical things with regard to the question of good and evil. If we can live in and attune ourselves to unity as much as possible and avoid the separative motivation we're much more likely to be healthy. We're not talking about a cosmic escapism. We're just talking about a shift of focus, almost like what the uh, uh, utilitarianism used to be. What would be the consequence if my action were magnified to all of society? Rather than thinking about personal ends, 
we think about a greater end. This involves, since we don't have knowledge in the transcendent, uh, transcendental state that we, like we have in the mental consciousness state, this involves a reliance on intuition. Therefore, the intellectual life has to be balanced with an intuitive life, and if it is not balanced with an intuitive life or some semblance of faith that leads to an intuitive life, uh, it's likely to become unhealthy. So the more we can live in unity or in that higher sense, even though we don't know what it is, the more likely we are to have a healthy life. Clearly, a second practical thing about this is, is the more that we can avoid separative ego identification, the more we will avoid pathological projection. I don't think we ever have to worry about losing an individual perspective. We'll always have that. And I don't think we have to worry about losing the flavor of our character. We'll always have that. I don't think we have to worry about missing experiences. But what we do have to do is avoid identification with a personal perspective that uh, makes us liable in all of our thought. And every time we think we are projecting, we just noted that very fact, because that is the nature of the mind, the mind interacts with what it is building or creating, or what is in reality. So the more that we can use our mind as a focus for something beyond it, the better we are. And clearly, a third obvious thing is that the more we participate in intentional, conscious, creative imagination, the more creative work we do of any kind, the more likely our personalities will be spiritualized. The more likely we will be attuned to the one. Even though our creative works may at first seem like a vomit or something like that, it's just part of the cleansing process. This is saying then that for our spiritual health and our, mirror, our uh, moral health, the more we participate in intentional, creative activity where we take imaginations and manifest them and manifest them in a way that is pro-evolutionary to the general process of what is going on in nature, the more likely we are to be finding our way to the good and to being healed. There are also some not-so-obvious practical things in this, which we're going to look at, <coughs> uh, because they lead to basic philosophies about how to deal with evil. We have to do a little bit more of wrenching before we can get there, because it is, you know, it's all not so simple at all. For example, we've just said that uh, it is perfectly valid to look at an evil individual as a sick soul. Because we can see how it happens. Somebody deprived of love and gets, and gets their perspective in an isolated personal existence starts projecting all kinds of personal things. Now this seems reasonably true. But I'm not certain it's a complete truth. Mm -hmm. Because if this were true, all psychopathologies would then have some immoral or evil character about them. And that's not true. Because there are psychopathologies that produce harmless personalities. Even if we observe, <laughs> if you hang around Microcosm Bookshop long enough, you'll get plenty of opportunities to observe. If you see the anger of a schizophrenic, that's very different than the malice 
of an intentional evildoer. Even if the schizophrenic commits murder, it's very different. Even if somebody is a psychopathic murderer, that's very different than a sorcerer or someone who by magical powers tries to control the consciousness of other people and perverting, pervert them to its own ends. And it's not just a matter of degree. It seems like there is a flavor to evil that is different than just the flavor of psychopathology. Now, this gets into really difficult stuff. I'm going through, I'm sharing the hardest things I'm thinking about and have thought about for quite a few years. It's pretty obvious that everyone who is evil is psychopathic. But it is not obvious that everyone who is psychopathic is evil. That's basically what we're saying. It seems as though there is something not merely atheistic, but anti-divine, anti-human, anti-progress in someone who is evil. Now, I don't mean to say that somebody is out and out evil. We're not, uh, we, we've already seen where that kind of dualism gets you. It gets you to a place where you can't say anything. But someone who is strongly of a malevolent evil nature. Now, this is difficult when you think about it because Evil beings and good beings, or people who are more evil and people who are less evil, or people who are more good and less good, have the same auras, right? They're made of the same stuff. They have the same thought stuff, same emotional stuff. If this is true, that evil... If evil exists, and we've already we've already gone into all of those paradoxes about its existence and non-existence, but evil, if it does exist, it exists in such a way that there is something strikingly different about the nature of thought, about the nature of emotion and perhaps even the nature of action and form. It's a hard thing to say. I don't have a definite answer. But I know that I, I see a lot of people that are that are uh, uh, sick souls, but they're not at all evil. And I see people who are evil uh, and sick at the same time. It's, it's, a, it's a different thing. Brings up all kinds of interesting questions. Atheists like to say that there's an atheist morality. I don't know if that is there is an atheistic good or is there an atheistic uh, evil. You know, atheism is a totally different question than antitheism. But uh, in any case, the uh, subtler practical things about the nature of evil have to deal with how we treat the subject. And for all of the last few things that we have to say tonight, there are philosophies of how one deals with evil by working through the psychopathological element of it. Because that is something that we can work with through the mind. There are several philosophies about this. We've mentioned one of them before. One philosophy is to challenge it, to attack it, to expunge it, to fight fire with fire. Because we are of a mixed nature, and I don't think there's a person in the room that doesn't feel that they've done something basically wrong at some time or another, 
something that was anti-God, anti-human, anti-nature, anti-creation. We've all done things like that. Sometimes because human nature is like that at this time, because we have fallen, sometimes this is necessary. Uh, Gandhi would dis- disagree, but uh, sometimes, I, I, to me, it seems that fighting the Second World War may have indeed been a good thing to do. However, we must remember that any time we take this philosophy toward evil, to identify it as best as we can and then to expunge it, that as soon as we do that, we are immediately acting in kind. And that the destruction of evil destroys the destroyer as as much as the evildoer. So, uh, in short, uh, this does not appear to be a very wise philosophy. It seems to be something that the urgency of sometimes in our very fallen nature, in our very imperfect nature, is necessitated, but I don't believe it's a wise philosophy because it's temporizing at best and it is uh, continuing our very negative ways that we have now. A second philosophy about how we deal with evil suggests just studying it and studying its protagonists for what they are and then freely choosing to not interact or partake of that. This school of thought usually sees evil as a perversion of the good and not as a dualistic counterforce, saying like we have a choice of how things can be done. This has a lot to offer. It does suggest some kind of transcendence or some kind of withdrawing from too quick of action to where you can get to a neutral vantage point to see something for what it is and uh, act accordingly. If it's the good, enforce it. If it's not good, uh, just shy away from it. It's also wise in that it keeps a person from hasty opinions, reactive opinions like the first school. I've not come to a final conclusion about this school of thought. Uh, I do like the idea of everything should be open and that it shouldn't be kept secret, shouldn't be kept mysterious. You know, like some things, like the evil, should be kept in the dark. And I really like the idea of freedom and the ability to choose from freedom what we do or what we don't do. On the other hand, uh, over the years, and I've read a number of books on the subject, I like studying what philosophies what effect they have on their adherence and what comes out of it. And uh, when one looks at what is evil, one's attention is drawn to it. And it gets energized, just like the uh, Branch Davidians energized their own projections. Even if they're the projections of others, we energize them. And where we look is where we go. You know, we're driving down the road and we look at a a deer off the side. Suddenly, if we're not careful, we find a car pulling off in that direction. Because where we look, where we put our attention is where our consciousness goes. And because human nature is what it is and because we are weak as we are weak, if we look at evil and to clearly try to understand evil and try to think our way through evil, we may find ourselves being influenced by it. And what I have found from adherence of this school is that uh, 
it in effect has people who don't do malicious things, but who do, but who have in some way empowered fear in themselves, where they have a whole panoply of devils. Uh, I would say that they are more aromonic than luciferic, but in saying that, I put myself in the same uh, the same gambit. So it is not due to a fault of the philosophy. It's just due to the fact that uh, what we do is what we become, or what we look at is what we become. Now it's important to note that in all of these things. We're not trying to directly look at evil in these talks. We're trying to, in abstract, look at evil and looking at various influences from our own experiences because I don't want to get into a thing where I actually try to say this is evil, this is evil, and this is evil because that, in effect, does strengthen it. The school of thought that, uh, with regard to how to practically deal with evil that has influenced me most is different. It is not a uh, philosophy of ignorance of either active or passive evil, uh, ignorance of evil, but that it is to look at the good. I don't know how to say it, that if we indeed aspire to be good, and even if we don't know what that is, because that again involves intellectual knowledge, but if we intuitively draw our minds and follow our intuitions to trying to live good, positive, loving lives, and do not place undue or as little of attention as possible on evil, that we do the very best. This is not trying to say it doesn't exist. It's not trying to say that not trying to say that uh, uh, we should, uh, you know, keep it in the dark or anything like that. Because keeping it in the dark would be actively manifesting the dark. However, if we try to strengthen the light wherever we go, again, assuming that there that evil is a misapplication of a good principle that any time that we aspire to the good if we have something in us that is imperfect or if we do need to learn about evil we will find it right within that principle I believe in initiation into the good by someone who strives to do the good automatically in striving to do that one and the same time realizes how this could be misused, especially if we still have the seeds of uh, uh, sin and darkness in ourselves. So it seems to me that it is a very positive philosophy to strive for the good, and when evil or something that appears to be such arises within us, to look for the principle that is good and to strengthen that, and in that way, the uh, evil is avoided and is weakened, and I think that's about a very healthy way, practical way of dealing with it. There is one more school about how to deal with evil, uh, which we won't get to until way late on when we start talking about start talking about the Manichees. Manichees had a totally different uh, view about evil, and uh, it was quite a strong one. I like it, but I uh, uh, don't know that I could do it myself at this point. That's about as far as we're going to go tonight. Next time we're going to look at dualism in a much different way, because obviously we can see that the uh, antagonistic way of looking at dualism leads to internal argument. And internal argument is terribly frustrating. And uh, it's it's very good if you're not looking for some final, ultimate answer. You can see that by looking at it this way, and this way, and this way, every time we came to another paradox, and to another way that we couldn't say anything definitive, but every time we did this, 
we came to another understanding about what the nature of evil is and another, another kind of discrimination that we have to make, such as the discrimination between psychopathology and uh, the anti-divine nature. That's about it for tonight. Richard, you're a spin master. I never realized you were a spin master. I have a, qu have a couple of questions directed right at you. Um, firstly, um, this is really a dilemma for you. Yes. Okay. Um, secondly, uh, when you get to something this uh, heavy, after the speech, would you be willing to, or talk, would you be willing to open it up for 15, 20 minutes of discussion, or? If people want to discuss, fine. I'm, uh, I'm asking. Okay. Yeah, if people want to discuss, I'm, I'm fine for it, but I'm not necessarily going to dive in for any more. I, I, I have a, a lot that I don't put in the notes. Uh, because, you know, and I, you know, I have already, all right, next thing. Okay. So, since uh, uh, I listened to this, I mean, and there are some things that I had not <coughs> thought about, but there are some things that became a little bit more clear and pretty much convinced me of it, is there is no such thing as evil. It is our own projection. So, uh, yeah. It is our own projection, and projections combined with when we say something is evil, we have already judged it. When we say something is good, we have already judged it. We haven't done that in here yet, though. Yeah, I, I just mean, but we've already done that. And so are you saying that projection is evil? <laughs> I'm saying that that when we call something evil, when we name something a name, whether we call it evil good, indifferent, whatever, we have placed a judgment on it. So then, then you're saying that evil is judgment, a nominalistic judgment, is what you're saying. He's a French structuralist. French structuralists have gotten to this point 25 years ago. No. This, is the, this is the core of a certain brand of feminist uh, criticism in France. You, you, you've just come across it. I mean, that's what they said, the, the, the name of the Father. Mm. And that's exactly what they've been screaming about, in the name of the Father. Because cause what I'm getting at is this. If we don't call it evil, and we don't call it good, and whatever ideas we project, I think the difference of whether we call it evil or good is, number one, it does not agree with the mainstream of the other human beings on this planet. Um, it is not in service of other human beings on this planet, or in service of others, or mankind in general. But there you just placed a judgment. Yes. Yes, we have placed a judgment. I agree. But in the big scheme of things, what it ends up being is, even if what we call evil, it is still progression in, it is still a progression or growth mainly as an experience, okay? And as an experience, even if in our quote-unquote judgment it appears to be evil and is going backwards, it is still forward for this soul as an experience. Have you ever made a mistake? In my own judgment? Yes. yes. Have you ever done something that in your own judgment you think was not good? In my own judgment, yes. Would you do it again? If I had nothing to base it on, I probably would. But I'm basing it on my judgment. My judgment. This means that if you, if you had the, 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 uh, you, I've, the, the quality of the perspective that you're now holding, would you, would you do it again? I've if you had, were thrown back there, given a second choice. I've had the experience now, okay? If I didn't have the experience and the situations were the same... But you're not answering the question. I will. If, this, if I were thrown back there and I did not have the experience of, of performing whatever it was that I didn't like about my, you know, that the act that I didn't like, I didn't have the experience, 
to fall back on on my on my memory or or uh, experience bank or whatever I want to call it, and I had nothing to compare it to, and nothing to uh, relate it to or how it would affect me. I would not know if it was good or evil. I would simply do the act to experience it. What would you do? Uh, what would you say? about uh, doing something to take away somebody's ability to experience and to consciously gain from experience. If I hadn't experienced if I hadn't experienced it or in my own mind already hadn't placed the judgment on it, I could not say if it was good or evil. Okay. Whereas okay. labeling or judging being used as a tool to manipulate Mm-hmm. You could call lots of things evil. Yeah, but what, all you really want is to control something else. Yeah. All I'm, uh, the, but the, mind you, I'm not saying that thus and so is evil or, or not. That's not at all the, yeah. But somebody could do that and just use it as a, the, the act of labeling or judging as a tool or the way to manipulate is really just a matter of power or control. Bonnie has something she wants to bring in. Um, I wanted to um, embellish from my uh, perspective when you were talking about a schizophrenic doing something that might be interpreted as evil versus somebody who um, is is more of a vehicle of evil and a different flavor about it. Um, one of the things that to to figure a schizophrenic from another person who isn't schizophrenic is to ask. When you hear voices, are they voices that only you hear, or are these voices that another person could hear? And it seems to me that um, a person who is psychotic is functioning from their their own individual pathology versus their own definition of themselves from their pathology versus somebody who's trying to go about being evil or is has become has developed it to such a, a point where they function in an evil way much of the time uh, defines himself by the world view of them. So they have, might have gained a lot of power in their lifetime because of the definition that they have um, uh, accepted from other human beings. A person that I've seen who goes about doing good or people who go about doing good seem to function from definition that they try to define from God, intuition. They define themselves by what they think God is defined as. As a, and so I see sort of three separate ways here. The the psychotic, the person who is growing in evil and the person who is growing in good as uh, developing that way because of where they're defining themselves and their actions. I don't know if that makes any sense. No. Yeah, that's maybe there's intention thing. That's uh, that's what I spoke about. That the uh, difference between a psychotic and the, a, someone who has some quality that is other is a conscious intention. Yes. See what uh, Bonnie touched on a good. Uh, a good point there, which uh, I had forgotten about definitions. When an experience is undefined and on, uh, has not yet taken place, um, then there is no judgment yet. So the force that is there to allow you to experience this, that force is not good or evil. It is the force. If you now take action to have an experience, then after that, you may be judged or you might be judged by the human race as having performed a good or evil act. But the force that allowed you to do that is still only the force. What would you say about somebody who came to a conclusion? that uh, an act was evil, anti-divine, anti-human, anti-nature, and by intent did it. Say that again. 
Suppose there was an individual who had gone through experiences uh, and was very experienced, very knowledgeable, very erudite, and knew that a given action was not pro-God, not pro-nature, not pro-human, but intentionally did it. It's like a lobe killing, a lobe killing clearly in the case of the people who self aware of it. How about something in the paper I was reading, this is in Kaczynski, what the Unabomber, saying how he had written down in some journal or diary or something about considering himself like the guy who went to the top of the tower and the text and shot people on campus for a year. Uh, the person who actually went to the top of the tower and did it it may have been less evil than the guy who said, I'm right side, and then kills people by saying it's through the men. I think they're both psychotic, really. They're psychotic, but no. one is more aware or no. has more intention than the other. No, 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 no. The Unibomber chose each individual target as somebody who's considered emblematic of evil. He, he considered technology evil when used in a certain way and chose his victims. He and considered himself well, doing well, the guy evil. Who, he didn't consider himself doing evil. But the guy who went to the top of the tower with the rifle didn't seem to do as much choosing or have as much intention as... Well, I mean, the, the, the guy at the top of the tower wasn't, wasn't operating that good evil. It's clearly psychotic. That's what I'm saying. Richard's question is, is, if a person yeah. knows that something is is against God and they choose to do it anyway, where is this coming from? Why are they... Is that what you're... Yes, yeah, and, and, and... Go ahead. I think that it's coming from that they feel uh, they, they're choosing to, to hold themselves uh, higher than God. They're not defining by God and that they're against God, but I think it's more of a definition from the world. They see their, the world is limited to the world and that God isn't part of it. I think it's in the absence of God and their definitions yeah. come from other people. Something. And they're gaining power by drawing it from other people. And something we are doing an act of God by blowing up the world trade center. Yeah, but but some but but some do not. Some they, they, some people feel that their um, some people feel it is their nature, their due to be against God and against everything in creation. Isn't that what evil is all about? Is gaining power and being more powerful than God? Isn't that what we're talking about? Uh, I don't know. I still think it's... That's what they traced Hitler's evil to. He was, he was more powerful than the art instructor who denied him a, a scholarship in an Austrian art school. That's exactly where you trace back all the so-called evils. It's always you know, somebody who was misjudged at some point in time, so-called. That's, that's, that's where it comes from. Nobody, see, no, I'm not disagreeing with your idea that experiences, uh, even great mistakes and even intentional misdoing that one grows from is that, that, uh, what appears to be a seed of evil actually eventually, uh, bur uh bursts forth into a flower. Uh, that, uh, there's no, no disagreement with that, but I'm just, uh, I, I'm questioning the, the other thing. Uh, it's clear that Ted Kaczynski thought he was doing a good thing for society. And it's clear that uh, some people have uh, uh, a mad rage and they knock off all kinds of people. And I'm not talking about people of that nature. I'm talking about a different kind of being altogether. Even the different kind of being, in his own mind, I would, I would still be willing to bet. I can't prove it, but in his own mind, I would be willing to bet that he, in his own mind, is correct. And he does not see the evil for the evil. Though he might see, well, this uh, you might call it uh, 